religion, literature, art brought together. As months went by, the team and the seculars were immersed in life at the house. Each season brought its own choice. Advents were filled with days of prayer and presentations. In one season alone, Father Cho presented the call from the desert, reflections on John the Baptist. Father William Hart McNichols presented a slide and music show titled I Sing of a Maiden, Mary, the Mother of God. Visitors to the house were treated to an Advent concert by Pascal Conforti and Fritz Wendt, and Roberta Nobleman presented Julian by J. Chanda, a one-woman play on the life of Julian of Norwich. After the holidays, on a very snowy January evening, Father Daniel Berrigan, Jesuit father, hosted a night of poetry reading. Lent included a series called Lenten Thursdays, evenings set aside for prayer, mime and drama. The team hosted Abraham and Isaac, a puppet show performed by John Bankert, a Franciscan puppeteer. It was an adaptation of one of the plays performed in the Chester Cathedral in the Middle Ages. It included a meditation on the theme of obedience to God's will. There was also a one-character drama performed by Roberta Nobleman called Solo Flight, based on the life of the Reverend Jeanette Riddleon Pickard, first woman to pilot a stratosphere balloon and one of the first women ordained in the Episcopal Church. With it was another Lenten reflection on discrimination, conversion and obedience. And William Hart McNichols presented This is my beloved son, ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus, a meditation in art and music, representations over the centuries of art of Jesus. All of these programs were an attempt to bring religion, literature and art together on a small scale and within the reach of many who might not have had an opportunity to experience it. Some of it was traditional, some avant-garde. All presentations were well attended and greatly appreciated. In keeping with this, the team decided in its third year to build a library within the building. They wanted visitors to have access to reading materials that would normally be unavailable to them. One of the smaller bedrooms on the top floor was set aside and the team commissioned floor-to-ceiling bookcases from the father of one of the seculars. Roddy McConey was a carpenter by trade and in a few short weeks he transformed the room into a quiet place for visitors and volunteers to sit and read. The team filled it with Franciscan and spiritual literature as well as tape recordings. It ran purely on an honor system. Borrowers signed out books and returned them when they were done. All of the items in the library were donated. Holy Week at the house was especially cherished, with special programs beginning on Holy Thursday through to Easter morning. Reverend Monsignore John Timian, known as Father Jack at St. Mary's in Mount Vernon, where he was pastor, recalls the first time he went to the retreat house. I heard of the little portion while I was pastor of All Saints Church on 129th Street and Madison Avenue in Harlem, he said. I think that I received a brochure about it and called to see if they would be available for a day of reflection on a holy Saturday. They were, and I took some of my church leaders there for the day. Sister Ellie remembers that Holy Saturday well. One time during Lent we got a call from Jack Meehan, pastor of All Saints. He had heard about the little portion and he said he was calling to see if he could bring a group for a day of retreat on Holy Saturday. 
Sister Ellie remembers thinking that was an odd day to have a scheduled retreat. I was thinking that on Holy Saturday everyone is running around preparing for Easter Sunday. But she remembers Father Jack saying he thought Holy Saturday would be a good day to set aside for the people who minister at All Saints, such as the lectors, ushers and other volunteers. Sister Ellie said she would do it, but I had this attitude that they were really not going to come. Because it was the day before Easter, she prepared for it anyway. At 9.30 in the morning they arrived. There must have been maybe about 20, she said. Father Jack arrived with them and stayed for the entire day of reflection. That really impressed me very much, she said, because you'd expect, oh, I'll bring my people here and then I'll pick them up later. But he participated and was fully supportive throughout the day. Sister Ellie said she remembers how eagerly the visitors responded to what the team had prepared. The parishioners who came with Father Jack that day were impressed. The folks that I brought loved the day and the place. Everyone made us feel welcome. It was a wonderful way to spend a holy Saturday, he said. Several folks stated that they'd like to come back for a longer retreat. After that, Father Andre and Sister Ellie made it a point to come to All Saints on an occasional Sunday. This enhanced our relationship. Indeed, that was the beginning of a friendship that lasts until this day, with Sister Ellie often visiting St. Mary's in Mount Vernon, where Father Jack eventually became pastor. He has since retired. Holy Week was not the only time for special events. Each year the transitus, the anniversary of St. Francis' passing, and feast days of St. Francis and Claire were commemorated with liturgies, rituals, and celebrations. The rest of the year was filled too. Retreats for senior citizens, days of reflection, silent solitude retreats. The team and the volunteers gave retreats to weigh out church ministries, an evangelical program in the South Bronx that worked with alcoholics and addicts. My brother's place, a shelter for men. Emma's house, a shelter for homeless people who were searching for a stable community life. The team also welcomed CCD teachers, staff members of the vicariat, South Bronx lectures and pastors. Each time a group visited, they were greeted with warm hospitality. They were given meals, prayer time, liturgy. They were fed physically and spiritually. This was done with love and a great deal of enthusiasm. And it was done for 10 months each year because the house was closed during the summer months to allow the team to work elsewhere, but also out of regard for visitors' comfort. The building was not air-conditioned. As time went on, the team and secular Franciscans came to a realization about the retreats, that the spirit of the gospel indeed was alive to all those who came to the house. It was giving the visitors a place to voice their experiences that became important, not so much as the preaching of the gospel. I remember in our team discussions talking about the fact, and Father Cho was the one who had a real sense of this, that people do not need a lot of input from us, said, said Sister Ellie. What helps them, and I think this was true, was to try to offer maybe a story from the gospel or an image or something that would help them to gather around that image their experiences. They come filled with experiences, but the experiences needed some way to be interpreted or held. It was an insight that the team grabbed hold of. I attribute that to Joe said Sister Ellie. He said, we don't need to talk to them a lot. They need the quiet, to walk in the silence, to welcome a place where they are peaceful and can be safe, and then to offer some way to help them to illuminate the faith 
that they bring, Sister Ali said. It was a valuable gift to the community. Because of the high crime rate, churches were locked all the time. No longer could the faithful drop in for quiet or prayer time. The little portion filled a need in the community. It was a respite from the struggles of living day to day, paycheck to paycheck. On all the retreats, Days of recollection, solitude days, it was obvious to the team and volunteers that visitors were grateful to have a place to be, a place to witness their faith, to put aside the cares of the world, to be welcomed and fed spiritually. This was a need that was not and could not be met in the soup kitchens and shelters. Visitors needed the quiet to walk in the silence said Sister Ellie. She felt the house was a place they could be safe and it helped to illuminate the faith they brought with them. They carried the faith, hope and love and the team's job was to help them experience it more deeply, she said. Father Andre had many experiences that attested to this. I do remember finishing a day of recollection with a group of ladies from St. Augustine's Church. At the end, one of them got up and said, Now sit down, Father. They then began to sing and witness to me about the powerful presence of God in their lives, said Father Andre. It was, he said, a teaching in reverse. Secular Franciscan Lorna Stewart tells of speaking to a group of visitors on a day of reflection. I was sharing in a teaching about my journey as a single parent and the trials and tribulations that I had faced in my faith journey, she said. She remembers one woman thanking me for sharing and proceeding to equate that with her raising six grandchildren in a burnt-out apartment in Harlem. Who was ministering to whom? Incidents like this happened often. The team and fraternity members would often leave feeling fulfilled. They were not doing all the giving. They were being spiritually fed too. Not once in the nearly ten years the house was open did a retreat go badly. It was a time of learning for the team and the secular Franciscans who were bringing hope to those visitors as prescribed in their rule. Mindful that they are bearers of peace, which must be built up unceasingly, they should seek out ways of unity and fraternal harmony through dialogue, trusting in the presence of the divine seed in everyone and in the transforming power of love and pardon. Messengers of perfect joy in every circumstance, they should strive to bring joy and hope to others. Article 19